Here I am inside one of the Pueblo cliff dwellings. If you notice, there's this black soot on the ceiling. That's because they would cook in here actually. And they'd stay in here during the winter time um, so they could deal with the weather and everything. And then uh, during the summer, they would actually stay a lot of times on the cliff tops. They get a good breeze and everything. But these were areas where they could protect themselves because notice this ladder down here. If there's an enemy or something coming, they can do away with the ladders and they'll be safe up here. Um, but all throughout this, these cliffs here, they have these little dwellings carved into the side. Actually, these people during the summer lived down in the valley down there, you see. Those are the ruins of some of the homes. and we're putting together, again, the oral traditions of the descendant groups to reach some kind of conclusion about how and why they were used. So when I am here in Mesa Verde, I talk about um, what I call uh, typical Kiva features. And typically, Kivas are round, not always though, but typically they're round. Uh, typically, they have an area here that we today call a banquette on the banquette. Uh, some descendant groups say, oh, they sat on those. Others say, no, they put their ceremonial objects on those and they sat on the floor again. So we don't know and that's not one of the things in life that makes a big difference to me. Um, but we also have pilasters typically here at Mesa Verde. And so on those pilasters we had long logs, usually the pinyon pine or the jennifer, Rocky Mountain jennifer, uh, Utah jennifer, perhaps occasionally a uh, Douglas fir because we did have some of those, and they would have lain a pole from pilaster to pilaster, working the way around and then working in and up at the same time using a technique called cribbing. You go to Spruce Tree House climb down into the reconstructed Kiva so you can see how that roof would have been constructed. And it was a thick roof uh, extending from the top of the pilaster to floor level so then the Kiva roof became an extension of their living area. Other typical Kiva features include ventilation shafts, this is where fresh air came in, deflecting walls that helped keep the fresh air circulating, then a fire pit. And then there would have been a ladder about right here that came up through the Kiva roof. Uh, so again, why the 
placebo, wide round, that's one we'll never know. An oral tradition that does work for me is the idea that they revered earth as mother, sky as father. These kivas are built up from the earth. They're not carved down. And uh, again, for those of you on this side, you can actually see they had to work around a big piece of sandstone. But then I think to myself, climbing down into the kiva, something that's built up from earth, would have been like climbing down into uh, the womb, some people believe, your mother's arms, others may believe. So again, those are little tea truths we're not sure about. But one reason why we're pretty convinced that they were used for ceremonial purposes is this little hole. Uh, this hole is called a sepapu today. Not all of them are visible here at uh, Cliff Palace. Uh, we see much better sepapus than some of the other dwellings. Uh, this hole serves no purpose whatsoever. Uh, but, again, if you listen to the old traditions of the descendant groups, they tell us that the people came into this world from previous worlds. Usually those worlds were cold, dark places. And so the Sipapu is a symbolic point of emergence. And since Sipapu is a in Kiva, uh, we think that Kivas were spiritual places, just as today you might find a cross in a church, a symbol inside something that um, means something greater than just an individual dwelling. Any questions before we begin making our way out? I have not seen or read about one anywhere but a Kiva, but we don't always see them in Kivas either. So we don't know um, if perhaps they just were filled in over time. And some are more defined than others. Some are, some are just little divots um, over in Mughouse. And you've already been to Mughouse? Okay. And in uh, Longhouse, we actually see... Um, Sipapus that are lined in the ceramics that they use to build their pots. Um, other things that we sometimes see with kivas that aren't typical are like passageways that are associated with the kivas. Uh, but again, this is not always. Some people um, surmise that perhaps they had um, spirits such as the Zuni today have the Kachina, and that the passageways were a means of uh, entering and exiting by the spirits. But again, we don't know for sure, and we don't see those passageways used extensively. So again, that's one that I'm not sure about. All right, let's end on one more oral tradition. I'd like everybody to take a couple of deep breaths for me. When you get to the top of those ladders, you're going to appreciate that. <laughs> so this other, this oral tradition was shared with me um, by a wonderful woman named Nina. She's a Santa Clara Pueblin elder. And uh, what she says is that air is the thing that connects all of us, um, animals, plants, uh, people, all of us together. It's the one unifying factor. And that by sharing air with each other now, we are forever connected with each other, but we're also forever connected with this place and anyone before who has been to this place. So by taking those breaths, you are now forever connected with the ancestral Pueblans, uh, the people who once lived here. And I hope that you'll continue to read about the Ancestral Pueblins, visit other Ancestral Pueblin sites. Uh, my friend Clyde likes to say, when you, when you go on a tour, you're actually getting one thin slice of the pie. And that you actually have to go on many different tours before that pie finally starts to take shape. And I don't know that it would be possible to ever put the whole pie together because there are still so many missing pieces, if you will. Um, but do pay attention to oral tradition. Listen to stories. If you ever have the opportunity to meet a Native American, um, to listen to uh, his or her stories, uh, I think that those stories are what help us fill in the missing pieces, make those little key truths, uh, take on some big T characteristics in a way that archaeology, geology, biology, science is never going to do. So now what we're going to do is make our way out. We're going to follow the path, steps, ladders, about 
So, uh, what Lewis is going to be doing is a process called carding. That's when you separate the manure, the twigs, the sand, whatever the, the, the sheep is grazing out there, whatever collection is wool. This is how they uh, clean it. And back in the old days, they used, to, they used to do this process by hand. So the process took a long time. So when the train post came around with carding tools like this, it made it much easier for a rug weaver to card wool. And after she's done carding, she's going to roll it up and spool it into a yarn. And just to the right side of her, there's a, a handmade spindle. And that spindle is made out of a juniper seed or oak, depending on how heavy she wants the spindle. And that piece of wool that she carded will probably stretch out to maybe two yards a yard. Maybe a little bit longer than that. So now she's going to integrate it and start spooling using her lap, rolling it back and forth. It looks pretty simple when she does it, but it's actually pretty difficult when you start doing it yourself. And there's four basic colors of sheep. There's black, white, brown, and gray. But if you want more elaborate colors in your wool or your yarn, there's a chart over there against the whole gun wall. That's to give you an idea of what we use for natural dye. We use leaves, barks, roots, and berries, or certain plants in them to get a color that we want. So that's the natural dye that we use. A lot of the rug weavers, they, they use commercial dye, but the price of the, the rug goes down if they use commercial dye. So they prefer all natural dye, just like that one. And this process is taught at a young age, about four to five years old. They'll sit there with their grandmother, their mother, teaching them, teaching them how to cart the wool and the spooling of the wool. Once you get into your teenage years, I'd say about 12 to 14 years old, They'll sit there with their grandmother or mother again, teaching them the different styles of rug throughout the reservation. And to give you an idea, this reservation is as big as West Virginia. So every corner of this reservation, they use specific colors and specific patterns for that specific area. So according to, to the region, that's, the how, that's how the rug, uh, rugs are different. And all the designs are different and according to the, the region. And, um, what she's uh, doing will probably take three months to make one rug this size. Some are wide, some are longer, some more, are more uh, extravagant designs in there. So according to how difficult the rug is, that's how much it will take. Some will take even six months to a year. If it's a really big rug with all these different designs and patterns, it will probably take a year. And uh, there's tools that they use right here. This is uh, the Kiowa tool that they separate the string. Uh, th uh, there's two strings that go up and down and they have to fit their fingers through there and they, she uses the comb right there to pack it down to pack the, the yarn down and make it tight so this has to be tight at all times if this is loose somewhere the rug will sag it won't look right so they have to be really meticulous uh, when they're making their rug and uh, that's the, the rug weaving and there's the blueprint that she has is all in her head. There's no cheat sheet or anything, so they're taught at a young age to memorize their their, their rugs. And now what she's doing uh, is a, a corn grinding. And this is still practiced today on the reservation. The main use we use it now is for ceremonial purposes. When a young woman comes of age, when she has her first menstrual, she has to do a ceremony. They call the beauty way. And she has to grind corn like this, maybe 15 to 20 pounds worth of corn. Mm -hmm. And her immediate family, brothers, uncles, siblings, aunts, everybody she knows will help her out. And once they get this into powder form, they add all natural spices to it, uh, to it and then they bake into a cake. The cake is usually about 3 to 4 inches thick, about maybe 4 or 5 feet around. It's circular. <laughs> it's baked on the east side of the Hogan. It's a celebration that we do for a young girl becoming a woman. So we have to celebrate that moment for her. Usually the medicine man and the patient, the young woman, would be on the uh, west side of the Hogan. And what the medicine man will do is teach her, tell her how to be a young woman, how to carry herself in public, uh, how to talk to other people, what her duties are as a young woman. All of this is disclosed uh, on her at that time and her maternal and paternal grandparents would be there teaching her along the side. So it's a very 
important ceremony that we do for a young girl becoming a woman. We, we call it the beauty way ceremony. And we do, uh, we do this even to this day. And what she has in her hand now is buffalo grass. That's what we use for uh, a brush or a comb. And in Navajo tradition and our culture, both the male and the female, they both have long hair. And it represents long life wisdom and the rain. Throughout North America, Native American people, they have long hair for a reason. They just don't grow their hair up to have it long or for intimidation. It represents something to us. Out here, we're in the desert. So in Navajo, it represents rain, long life, and longevity with wisdom. All this, that's why we have long hair. The Lakota, Cheyenne, Sioux, Comanche, Apache, all these different tribes, they have their own stories why they have long hair. So ours, we live out in the desert, so rain is the most important. That's why we have long hair. And um, what they're standing in is what they call a, uh, a female hogan. The roundness of this hogan, they say, it represents a pregnant belly of a woman or a skirt of a woman. And there's usually nine main posts that go all the way around to form this whole structure. That represents nine months of pregnancy for a woman also. These are one of the main poses right here. There's a couple of them over here and there's one right here. And they usually go four feet to the earth and they stick up three and a half to four feet to this point. And that's the foundation. And right in the middle, these three layers of logs is the backbone of the Hogan. This has to be a certain length and a certain density. This, these logs, uh, these three layers should be uh, very big about maybe 12 to 14 inch in diameter. And now from there, it gradually works as to way up to like smaller logs. So every log is like cut to a certain length and angle. So every log is self-supporting one another to the top. And uh, if you maintain the Hogan right, it lasts 75 to 80 years. That's a long time. And uh, there's no pegs or nails used for this structure, so that's the beauty of the hookah. Mm -hmm. There's no nails or anything, so it's self-supporting one another. And the weight is the key component at the top. There's a couple of tons of dirt on top. So what the dirt will do is it will squeeze the logs inward. And once it squeezes the logs inward, it will make it waterproof. So if you build the hogan right, it should be, when it rains, it shouldn't be no uh, leakage of rain. So 75 years, everybody, it will last you a long time. And every hogan that's built on the reservation should be facing east. The doorway should facing, be facing east. Because the Navajo believe that our gods and good fortunes come from the east every morning. The sunrise is very special to us. So we have to grab our corn pollen and say a prayer for ourselves and then for our family. It's very important that we do this every morning. And when the sun's about to set this and we say another prayer, living that whole day with all these emotions, interacting with your loved ones, just living life, being in Monument Valley. That's, that's when you say another prayer for that. Usually two times a day they do prayers like this. And there's another version of this called the male hogan. The male hogan is the earlier uh, stages of the hogan. It's called a fork shaped hogan. And it's more compact. And the biggest difference in the male hogan is there's a shelf that extends out to the east. A very small structure. We'll probably see one into my, uh, into my valley. A male hogan. So that we have two versions of the hogan. So, any questions, anybody? <coughs> I take it this here in the center area is the use for the, kind of like a fireplace where the smoke could rise. The chimney. Chimney, right? Yeah. Uh, ventilation, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any more questions, anybody? Now's the time. So, what's the temperature like in, in winter time? It's like oh. in, in here? In here? Yeah. It's normal. It's like maybe 50 degrees, 60 at the most. Very comfortable. It's well, nicely insulated. Right. So it's it's warm. Warm. Yeah, it's warm. Yeah. It's built for the winter and summer. That's the beauty of this home. In the summer, I'll keep the heat at bay. Yeah. And in the winter, uh, it's well, well, nicely insulated. So keep, keep the heat in. Yeah. Any more questions? Anybody? How many? One family. One family. It depends on. Okay. Three to maybe fifteen. 
it's all, it's all up to you how many kids you want to have. <laughs> Where do you prepare the food? Also inside? Right yeah. here. In the winter, it should be right here, and during the summer, be outside. Okay. That little shade house over there mm -hmm. on the side. Yeah. And our version of the patty, usually they would mm -hmm. cook food under there. Mm -hmm. They have be a little bit more breeze outside with the shade on top. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? And if not, if you want to tip Lucy, there's a basket right here for her, and then we can head out. And if you're down the street, we also can take a look at that. And uh, we have a lot of stuff to see. Thank <laughs> 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 you.